and turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to do a very much needed study here on uh, how Satan uses sexual sin to destroy Christians. Uh, you can do a lot of things as a Christian that will get you out of fellowship with the Lord, but I'll tell you what, there's a very serious thing there when you commit sexual sin be it pornography or fornication or especially like sodomy or something like that and whatever. I mean, you commit, you start getting into sexual sin, you're in deep trouble with the Lord, let me tell you. And I will tell you right now, from my years and years and years of experience knowing Christians, I have seen so many times where somebody was doing a good work for the Lord and it's just like sexual sin enters and bam, they're done. Never go back. I didn't say they lost their salvation. I didn't say... God can't still use them in some capacity or whatever else. But I'll tell you what, I have seen it. I remember when I was a boy, I remember this uh, pastor that we had, the assistant pastor, Brian Boykin, I think his name was. And he stood up the one Sunday and he said, his wife is standing there with him. And he said, um, I had an adulterous relationship with another woman. My wife has chosen to forgive me. We're going to stay together, but I'm no longer qualified to be a preacher. Today's our last day. Goodbye. And everybody's just, you know, what happened? Satan destroyed him because of his sexual sin. Now I'm going to show you that that is in fact what the Bible teaches. Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to show you also how to avoid getting messed up. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 through 13. Beware. Beware. Okay? That's how it starts out here. It doesn't say, you're a Christian, you're under the blood, don't worry about it. There's nothing for you to be concerned about. You don't need to be careful, or be, beware. He's writing this to Christians, he's writing this to saved people. Beware, lest any man spoil you. You can be ruined as a Christian. Still saved, still going to heaven when you die, but ruined, rotten. Beware, lest any man spoil you. Through what? Philosophy. Hmm. and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ what are the rudiments of the world well I heard this from Peter Ruckman many years ago and I think it's really good and I wrote it down here in the wide margins of my Bible the rudiments of the world are number one everybody else does it you use that to justify your sin you see and it spoils you Number two, we always have done it. A little bit doesn't hurt. My conscience doesn't convict me. We know when to quit. You got to make a living. It all depends on how you look at it. That's what lost people say before they sin. What's the big deal? I'm going to look, look, look at some pornography. Okay, I, I know a lot of people that do. Oh, what's the big deal? I'm going to drink a little bit. You know, I know when to quit. Mm-hmm. And as a Christian, you can listen to that and you can get spoiled as a result. Beware. Verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Well, glory to God, then we can go out and do whatever we want, right? There doesn't have to be a changed life. We can just, whatever happens, it's under the blood, man. Don't worry about it. Don't stress over it. Then why would Paul say to beware? You see? There are certain standards in Scripture that you had better follow if you ever want to get anything done for the Lord. There are certain things that you need to avoid like a plague and flee it. The Bible says you're to flee fornication. Flee sexual sin. Run away from it. But there are Christians, and I've seen, oh my word, I've seen this thing so many times, and they dabble in it and dabble in it and dabble in it, and I'm just going, stop, stop, you're heading for destruction. But they're just too smart. I don't want to quit, brother. It's okay. It's, it'll be all right. You know, well, in this unique situation and things, you know, I know the Bible condemns what I'm doing, but 
you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to fall for it. You, you can, you know, beware, beware. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people I've seen doing something for the Lord and they don't take my advice. They don't listen to the scriptures. And next thing you know, divorce or some other bad thing happens. Some woman doesn't take my advice and all of a sudden she's crying and weeping and well I had I had fornication with the man and so like beware well well it's 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 all forgiven and stuff like this and and you know the, the circumcision made without hands are the body of our flesh doesn't affect our soul and our spirit anymore like it once did in the Old Testament so is it really that big of a deal yes it is it is you can get to the point as a Christian where you've ruined your testimony, where you've ruined your life, and God just has to say, sorry, I'm going to have to pick somebody else. I'm going to have to pass over you. You're my child, but you've done this thing now. I have to pass over you and go use someone else for the work that I was going to use you to do. You didn't take heed. You didn't beware, and you got spoiled. Proverbs chapter 6. Go back in the Old Testament to Proverbs chapter 6. I'm going to show you what it says in the Old Testament about sexual sin. Proverbs chapter 6 verses 32 and 33. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding... He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, uh, good news, Christian. It doesn't affect your soul anymore. Why? Because of the circumcision made without hands. When you touch things in the Old Testament, if you touch that, you're unclean until the, till the morning, and you've got to go to the priest, and you've got to do the sacrifice commanded in the law and thing. It When you touch things... In the Old Testament, it affected your body and it affected your soul. It affected your soul. Not so in the New Testament. If you are dumb enough to go out and fornicate with somebody, you know, sex outside of the confines of marriage, you go out there and you fornicate, well, it's not going to affect your soul. You're not going to go to hell when you die. But the other things are still true. And I'm going to show you that it does affect your flesh. And if you live after the flesh, you will die. The New Testament says. But look at this. Verse 33. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Every single adulterer right now in the church age, they're going to have to deal with verse 33. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. I have known, I have known pastors. I have known Christians. I have known, I've seen this thing so many times. In my life, my saved life, uh, you know, since the Lord saved me, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. I've seen family men, and they're going along just fine, and they don't beware. They start to play and dabble a little bit in things that they shouldn't be dabbling in, start to flirt a little bit too much with that woman at work, you know. It's just friendly. I'm not going to do anything. I mean, she's young enough to be my daughter. I wouldn't do anything. Next thing you know, bam! Sexual sin. Marriage breaks apart whole thing falls apart. Some young woman and she's out there, single young woman and things like that, looking for a husband and, oh, I'm dating this guy now and stuff. And, and, you know, he's kind of, you know, propositioning me and kind of like to, you know, fornicate, you know, try it out before marriage, you know, kind of a thing. And you know, I don't know. I don't know. Get away from a guy like that. But she just, well, you know, I know when to quit. Rudiments of the world, you see. And all of a sudden, bam. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Well, God's forgiven. God can forgive you. Yes, God can forgive you, but you know what? That's going to be with you for the rest of your life. And people are going to look and say, oh, that's a Christian. <laughs> Did you hear about that? Did you hear about that? Yeah, this guy was married. Mm -hmm. Married. He went and had sex with some woman and stuff like this, busted the marriage up. And then, you know, He's going to, old Holy Joe over here, he's going to tell me how to live. What a shame. Divorce and remarriage statistics are the same among the uh, saved as they are with the lost. 
Why? Because a bunch of people weren't being afraid, beware. They wouldn't follow the advice of Scripture. Go back to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, not me, brother. I'm a Bible believer. I got, man, I got it under the blood. I got the old hymns playing in my car everywhere I go. And, brother, I got things. I got the sanctification. I got the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been witnessing to people. I've seen people get saved. I put out tracts and everything else. I won't fall. I've seen so many Bible believers fall through sexual sin. They just mess around. Just a little bit. Just a little. A little bit won't hurt. And they mess around and they mess around and they mess around and all of a sudden, and they're finished. I've seen some fine Bible-believing Christians. I mean, Bible believers have put me to shame. I knew a brother at that, that, uh, Liberty Baptist Church. And this guy, I mean, he you, you should have seen the guy's book collection. I mean, he had books printed in the 1700s. I mean, the library of this guy, it was incredible powerful man witnessing to people. I, I remember uh, the pastor there was telling me that hey, this guy and his wife would actually go to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses meetings and ask questions and stuff like this. And, and you know, God, well, we met a Bible believer and, and he said such and such. How would we answer that? You know, <laughs> and, the, and the Jehovah's Witnesses are like, I don't know how to answer that and stuff. And then, you know, he'd finally say, uh, by the way, I'm a Christian and uh, you people, you know, and he would use this. I mean, this, he had, he was showing me that the notes the, the minutes, the business meetings at Jehovah's Witnesses, Kingdom Halls. I mean, this guy doing all kinds of work for the Lord. And guess what? Sexual sin. Divorce. I've seen it. I've seen some of the strongest brethren out there. And I'm just going, man, that guy's really doing something for the Lord. Bam. Done. Finished. Marriage breaks up. Life falls apart. Going from... Uh, PhD. I've seen a. I had a. You know, one of the pastors I knew in the past. PhD. Doctor. Pastor of a big Baptist church. Boom. Fornication. Divorce. No longer pastoring. Living in some cruddy little apartment by himself. Left his wife and children. Satan will get you. Oh, not me, brother, because my flesh is strong. So I can dabble in things like that. You're kidding yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Be a coward. Don't get in the room and say, well, I'll just kind of, you know, maybe I can dabble with it a little bit and stuff like this and, and whatever. Flee it. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It doesn't affect your soul like it did back there in the book of Proverbs, back in the Old Testament. It doesn't affect the soul, but it sure affects the body. You're going to get that blot on you. You're going to get the people. And you know the worst part is? They're going to blaspheme this book because of what you did. The old saying, you know, zipper trouble. If you have zipper trouble as a man, you're going to cause this book to be blasphemed. And same thing applies to you women out there. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't have the right to do things with your body. You don't have the right to roll your sleeve up and say, give me a good tattoo here and a good one here and give me some piercings and some piercings. And You don't have that right. Your body was bought and the price that was paid is far greater than anything else on this in this universe, really. The blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. That's the purchase price for your salvation, and God owns your body. And the Lord tells you, flee fornication. Get away from this, this sexual temptation stuff. 
That's why I said, if you have a problem with pornography, and I realize pornography, you're not actually physically joining yourself with another woman and stuff and committing fornication and things like that, but you're sure getting pleasure from it. Read Romans chapter 2 on that. But pornography, you know what? If you're having a problem with it, stop using the internet. Don't walk past the adult, adult bookstore there and things like that. Flee it. Run away from it. Don't just say, well, come on, you know, it's not a big deal. If you're having a problem with it, you better flee. You better run away. Let me just say something to really convict you. What would happen if your internet viewing records were made public? They can do it. I got a cruddy little website, not even a big thing and stuff like this. I can go in with my little small website and I can see who's looking at my website when they looked at it. The operating system of their computer, I can go right to your door with my little website. What do you think they can do? The ones that control the internet, Google and all these people like that. Oh, it's just between me and, you know, just kind of secret and stuff like that. Yeah, it's a problem. I, you know, I just look at some pornography once in a while and things. Nobody else knows about it. I was at home by myself. No one knew it. Um, the Lord knows it. That's pretty bad. Number two, all the people at Google or whoever else, you know, whatever else, other internet, you know, military or whatever else, they know it. They got it all recorded. Hmm. Something to think about. And let me tell you something, Christian. If you're messing around with the flesh... You're a worker, you're a man, and you go out to your job someplace, and there's that pretty little girl there, and you just, it's nothing serious, brother. I mean, come on. I just, you know, flirt with her. Just, you know, it's, it's just fun joking and stuff like that. And I, I, you know, touch her arm and stuff like that, and she touches mine. It's just, a, it's a friendly, uh-huh. You know what the lost people think of that? They see you as a hypocrite. They look at you and they say, did you look at that? I know Christians that live together. What do you think the lost world thinks about that? I remember West Virginia Church, Baptist Church down there. My sister and her husband were going there. Went in there and it was like that couple lives together, that couple lives together, that one over there, living together. Well, oh, but they're not fornicating. Of course not. They just live together, right? Yeah, I'm sure the lost world thinks that. Lost World looks at those two people, that guy and that, that man and the woman going in there. Oh, they're just living together. They're not married or anything like that. But don't worry, they don't fornicate or anything else. The Bible says to abstain from all appearance of evil. Are you doing that as a Christian? Or are you dabbling? The devil gets you in sexual sin, you're ruined. God will forgive you. You're going to go to heaven when you die. But I will tell you right now, from years and years of experience, probably into the hundreds of people that I have seen this thing happen to, of pastors, of missionaries, of all kinds of things, and they get that sexual sin, bam, and they're done. And I see it, and I see it, and I just say, stop doing what you're doing. Stop. Flee fornication. You don't do it. Your pride gets in the way. Oh, don't worry, Brother Brian, it's never going to happen to me. And it does. I can look at this pornography online, brother. Okay, I'm trying to get over it and stuff like this. They're making records of you. Do you understand that? If they ever go after Christians, which I have no idea if they do, they could come out and say, here, are you really a Christian? Let's look at what you looked at. Do you want that brought up? First Corinthians chapter seven, verses one and two. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Knew of a preacher the one time and he said, I won't even shake women's hands. Why? Because it says there, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. You say, oh, how puritanical. Oh, how, you know, whatever. And so, mid-Victorian prudery and all this stuff. It's called being safe. It's called a man that says, I know what capacities I have. I know what I'm capable of if I don't keep this flesh 
under subjection. He's fleeing fornication. A lot can happen with a handshake. I've seen that. There's innocent handshakes that you just, oh, you know, congratulations, or hey, you just shake hands or something nice meeting you, whatever else. I'll do that. Sure. I don't go quite as far as the thing. I won't even touch women's hands or anything like that. I mean, if, you know, I don't like going through the store and like bump into an old woman or something, come around and bump into her and go, oh, unclean, unclean. You know, of course not. You know, you got to have some sense there. It's talking about sexual touching, okay, and, and intimate touching and that flirtatious, you know, oh, you're so funny and, uh, and stuff like this, or, or you kind of hit her in the leg a little bit or, you know, just kind of, uh-huh. You're playing with fire when you do that. But I'll tell you right now, I don't hug women. I hug my wife, okay? And that's it. She's the only woman I hug, you know, mother or something, that's fine, okay? But I'm not going to hug women. You meet me out in public and stuff like that, I'll say, nice to meet you. I'm not going to come over and hug you and say, nope. Say puritanical. Uh, no, uh, it's called uh, flea fornication. I'm not messing around. I'm not looking at some woman and say, oh, I think she's a slut, so she's going to try to come over. No, 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 that's not the case. I'm saying I don't want to get into that realm there. I'm going to flee it. I'm going to abstain from all appearance of evil. I'm going to tell you another little thing that we had back when we had Bible Believers Fellowship. We had some rules and things like that, and one of them was if a woman wants to talk about salvation, then a married couple has to be the one that goes and talks to her. No single guys or two guys or whatever else going and talking to this woman. Nope. Married couple. Say any exceptions? Absolutely not. And no woman that's single or whatever else can be with a pastor or whatever. That pastor's wife has to be there. Yeah. Or have another couple there or whatever else. You say, why? Because we're trying to avoid fornication. We're trying to avoid problems. And we never had a problem with those standards, with those rules. And in fact, I shouldn't say we never had a problem because one of the brothers actually at our Bible Believers Fellowship actually went to see a single woman that we were dealing with in the ministry and stuff like that. Uh, another brother had led her to the Lord and, and with him and his wife. And, you know, uh, this guy, single guy, went and saw her. And um, he was, you know, ended up leaving the fellowship. He was rebuked, rebuked very, very harshly for that, and uh, he didn't like it too much. I talked about that in other studies. You know, we forgiveness and stuff there, and we patched up our relationship afterwards. But the point is, um, that was the end. Out. Out you go. Thankfully, he didn't go as far as committing fornication, but uh, he was headed there. You have to have standards, brethren. Their standards must be there. If the devil can get you to that point where you cross that line and you commit that fornication because you've been just messing around and messing around and messing around, you're finished. I have never seen one Christian ever return back to the full-time service and really doing things for the Lord after they've committed that sexual sin. Never seen it. Never seen it. If you go far enough and you fornicate and you join your body to somebody else, you're done in ministry. You might come back. You might get to witness to people and give tracts and whatever else, but you got a blot on your record now. And the devil can bring that up. And I've seen that thing. <clears throat> and believe me, I've seen some real good Christians that this has happened to. Like I said, Christians that are a lot better witnessing to me, you know, witnessing than me. <laughs> you know, I've seen some real good Christians. Christians are a lot more studied in the Bible and really knew whatever. You know, they get messed up. And it's just a gradual, just, they just start falling apart. But what's our reaction supposed to be towards this? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There's some real important things in here to get. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of stuff about the Pauline epistles, a lot of the New Testament doctrine that's a very, very hard sayings. 
And a lot of people try to, well, you know, uh, and they use grace and stuff like this. Well, we got liberty and, you know, it's all under the blood. There's some things that we are called to do as Christians and we don't do it. You dabble around, you see. Let's read about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 13. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as it is as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Who is doing the reporting? The lost world. They look for any opportunity that they have or that they can get to say, look at that Christian, look at that, look, look what they're doing. Are you going to be the one that causes the word of God to be blasphemed because of your stupid mistake that you've made? Are the lost people going to have reports against the Lord and against His Word because of your corruption, because of your sin? Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Taken away? Hmm? For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. Paul's like, I don't even need to be there, man. I, get this guy out of there. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's a saved man. It's not going to touch his soul because of that circumcision there, the spiritual circumcision that's made without hands. So he touches this other woman. He joins his body to this woman, which is father's wife, what an abomination. He touches her, fornicates with her. Okay, it's not going to affect his soul and his spirit, but guess what? The flesh. You see? And Paul, what does he say? He says, well, just kind of, you know, just understand we all make mistakes. Okay? And none of us are perfect. And I'm not trying to judge when I say these. Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Let me put it into modern terms for you. Somebody does this thing, you say, I hope Satan kills you. Do we do that? Oh, well, just kind of, just kind of take it easy and stuff on them. They cause the word of God to be blasphemed. There's reports out there now where people, I mean, do you realize what happens when a lost person sees the hypocrisy of a Christian? When word of that gets around, people will use that as justification to not get saved themselves and they end up in hell. We just don't take it seriously, do we? You see, we can look out at the modern Christians and we can say, you know what? Look at those Laodiceans. Look at that. They're neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm. They say we're increased with goods and everything else. But you know what? We don't often point the fingers at us as Bible-believing Christians. Is there lukewarmness in us? How do we handle people out there that have committed sexual sins? Wicked sexual sins. Paul says, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Let's keep reading. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And again, I have seen this thing with these Christians that get messed up. You know what they'll do? After they get messed up, they'll continue down that downward path. And they'll try to draw you into it and justify their sins in your sight. I've seen that thing. And they'll, they're out of fellowship with the Lord and they'll try to pull you out of fellowship with the Lord. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It's talking about saved people that have had sexual sins. the advice. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Hey, that guy's a fornicator? Get out of here. Hey, you messed up your marriage? You made a fool out of God's word and of God's people. Get out of here. You say, well, come on. Let's keep reading. 
Verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. You can expect the lost world to fornicate and do all these other things here, covetous, extortioners, or idolaters. Of course they're going to do it. They're not saved. They have no capacity to stop those things. Witness to them. But what about a saved Christian? A genuinely saved Christian that does this stuff. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Do you follow that? You say, well, that's kind of hard. It's kind of a tough thing. It's real tough. But you know what? It's what the Bible says. Are we going to follow the scriptures or are we going to follow our feelings and emotions? You see, why is the body of Christ in such a rotten state right now? Because the old leaven is not being purged out. There's no accountability. There's no, hey, there's a serious thing, a consequence that happens when you commit that fornication, when you commit those sexual sins. You don't get kicked out of the fellowship anymore. Well, we just bring you in. And let's just hug you and just comfort you and everything else. And then they start to tear the other Christians down. And that leaven starts to leaven the whole lump. It's an epidemic. Verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. The lost people out there, they're without. I'm not going to spend my time, I'm not going to walk down the street and say to some guy down here, he's got to sit out front drinking a Budweiser beer and say, you're a fornicator. He'd probably be like, oh, whatever, you know, what are you, you know, oh, you're the crazy nut up there with all the gospel signs, you know, get off my property, you bleep, bleep, bleep. You know, God's going to judge him. You know, chance to witness, okay, fine. But what I'm saying is, I'm, it's not my judge to, job to go out there and judge every single person's sins, personal lives and stuff like that, but it is with saved people. There has to be judgment there in the body of Christ. We have to kick these people out. Verse 13, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. They're saved. They're going to be in heaven with me when I die. I'm going to see the guy that did this. You're going to see the guy that did this. You're going to go up and it's going to be like, you're the one. He's going to be there, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 5, we're going to meet him one day. But you know what? We're going to find out, so what was it? How'd you die? You see? But we don't take those stands, do we? We don't want to kick these people out. And as a result... That leaven starts to get in and it starts to leaven the whole lump. Romans chapter 8. A couple more places to turn to here and then we're going to be done. Romans chapter 8. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. I'm trying to warn you. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Mortify the deeds of the body. You know, it's going to take a major effort to get you away from pornography, if you're looking at that. And it's going to take you a major effort. You know what you might have to do if you're a Christian man and there's some pretty little girl there, it's a, a pretty little thing there at the work that you like to just kind of fool around with and stuff like that? Maybe you ought to quit your job. You know, again, I knew I knew a brother that was just writing, you know, just messaging a woman back and forth and stuff like that, and, and it started to get a little bit too whatever, and next thing you know, his marriage falls apart. He went too far. How serious do you take the sin, this sexual sin stuff? I mean, go through the Old Testament. God's just go in there and kill them, go in there and kill them. Why? There's people involved in sexual sins. It's a serious thing. You're going to have to learn to mortify the body. If you have a problem with pornography, 
get rid of the internet. You say, well, what am I going to, how am I going to stay in contact? Find another way. Take radical action. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The Bible talks about. You better be zealous. And if you're messing around and stuff like this, I've seen so many people and it's just, oh, well, you know, we kind of, you know, just living together and stuff like this. And, oh, you know, whatever. They get messed up. People from all different countries. I've had contact. I get a lot of emails from people and stuff like that. Well, oh, brother, you know, my, oh, I mean, we're kind of, you know, living together and we're, you know, uh, uh, you know, she, my girlfriend, girlfriend kind of wants, you know, to, you know, have sex. And, and I, I'm trying to tell her, you know, get away from it. Run, flee. Take serious action. Mortify your body. So no, no, I'm getting away from that. But yeah, just, you know, just, you know, just a little bit. I just, it's not a big deal. It's not really, you know. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present your body as a living sacrifice. You know what the image is? I'm crucified with Christ. How would you like to be on that cross? You think he felt some pain? Yep. Guess what, Christian? That's the image and the picture that you're supposed to have of what you do to your flesh, mortifying your members. In a spiritual sense, you're supposed to crucify your flesh. Take serious action before you fall into sexual sin and the devil says, gotcha. See, the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before the throne day and night. And all the devil has to do is just get in there and have you mess up big time and he can say, look at that. You're going to use that fornicator? You think the devil's going to be up there and go, oh, you know, you're going to, you probably shouldn't bless them because they, Technically, they did have sexual relations. He's going to be up there going, look at that, fornicator, ha, adulterer. Look at that. You're going to bless that? And I can tell you, I have seen it so many times where it just, it happens and the Lord just says, I've seen these people, the great, great soldiers for Jesus Christ and bam, they have that sin. And it's just like the Lord just goes, Boop, and turns it off. All that he's doing through them, boop, off. Doesn't matter what all they were doing and things like that. Just off. And you get around that Christian and stuff like this, and they'll talk about all this thing as well, it was what happened. And so they'll try to start pulling you down in. God will forgive them. God can still use them for some things, but that's never going to go back to that initial fellowship that they first had. And I'm telling you right now, you say, well, what's this? You know, fornication, physical fornication is worse than pornography. Yeah, it is. You're joining your body, okay? But let me tell you something. You keep messing around with the pornography, you're going to be heading into for physical fornication. Physical sin. Guaranteed. You're dabbling. You're messing around. And it's a very, very serious dabbling there. But, you know, I, I don't preach a lot of sermons like this. Where I'm very, very hard on rebuking sin. And it's just like forgiveness and forgiveness and forgiveness. Forgiveness is there. But let me tell you something, brethren. There's a lot of sins that you can do that there are sins unto death the Bible talks about. You can be forgiven. You can go to heaven when you die. Certainly. But there are certain sins that you do and you mess up one time and you're done. You will never go back to the, re the relationship you used to have with the Lord. You will have a blot on your record and it's never going to be erased. And if you do it in such a manner that you bring that you bring reproach upon the book and you make yourself, you know, it's people know about it and it gets talked around and stuff like that, you are in serious trouble with the Lord. And we just we get so we get, Bible believers get to be very Laodicean. We get to be very lukewarm. And it's just like, you know, and a lot of times I see it, I can see it happening in people's lives, and I'm just going, you better stop. And I kind of just I try to be gentle with it because I'm trying not to get people mad and trying to be nice and loving and all, all this stuff. 
And there's times I have not judged it when I should, when I see it, when I see it coming, I have not spoken up. And I, I see it and it goes and it's just like, I see them and they're starting to swerve on the road and all of a sudden, boom, and they crash. So I'm repenting, okay? I'm going to try to be a lot rougher. When I see people and they're dabbling in sexual sin and stuff like this, I'm going to be a lot rougher. And if you mess up and things like that, I'm not going to have fellowship with you. Just as simple as that. And Paul, you know, prays, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. We'll finish up here. Galatians chapter 5. And oh, the Baptist. Oh, brother. I have seen so much wickedness, so much things. I've seen Baptist preachers, teenage girls, guys, 50 years old, teenage girl, pretty teenage girl there and stuff like this. And he's playing with her hair and things like this and touching her and things and all that stuff. Playing with fire. Baptist churches are filled with it. And I'm picking on the Baptists. I don't even, you know, I'm not even going to talk about Presbyterians or Methodists or whatever else. They're just, they're gone. Okay. I'm saying... Baptist churches, I pick on them because they're still using, a lot of them use the King James Bible and they still had, hold to some good standards and things like that. But those things are rife with sexual perversion. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, and you go there and all of a sudden, brother so-and-so is not there and you go, hey, what happened to brother? And, and it's just like, you know, what, what's going on? Didn't you hear what he did? Left his wife. What? Yeah, he left his wife. They caught him, you know, happens all the time. We're not taking it seriously. You see, if Christians knew, if I commit this sexual sin, the body of Christ is going to turn on me and they're not going to fellowship with me anymore. If Christians knew that, they would say, you know what? I don't think I want that. I don't think I'm going to mess around with this fleshly desires and this fornication dabbling stuff. I don't want that. You see? But oh, don't judge. It's you know we all make mistakes. And uh... Galatians chapter five verse sixteen. And I'll tell you what else I got to say this too, and that is there's a lot of Roman Catholics out there. A lot of them are just you know sewer rats that they use their their religion to cover up their wicked lewd lives. Okay, but I'll tell you what there's some clean Catholics out there too, and they look at this mess that is the body of Christ and they say that's not any cleaner than what we got. We got priests covering up sexual sins. There's a Baptist pastor covering up sexual sins. Priests are getting away with it in the Catholic Church, and the Baptist preachers are getting away with it in their churches. Our divorce rates are the same as theirs. I've seen that, and that's why a lot of Catholics still reject the thing of eternal security because they say you Baptists and you you Bible believers and stuff, you're using eternal security as a cover for your sin to just say, oh, you can just commit any kind of sins and things like that, and everything's going to be fine. Well reported. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, mortifying your body, crucifying the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. You better get real spiritual. You better be very zealous. You better flee fornication. Don't ever think to yourself, that the Bible talks about, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Don't ever think to yourself, well, I'm in the book. I'm witnessing. The Lord's using me. The Lord's doing great things for me. I'll never have a problem. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Satan can get any single one of us, including me, if I'm not careful. A lot of you women that got saved and had boyfriends, lost boyfriends that you used to regularly fornicate with, and you tell that guy, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. Oh, I respect that and everything else. But could I still see you occasionally? He's going to keep working on you. And if you don't see a change in that guy's life and that he wants to get saved and he realizes he's a sinner, you better run from that man. 
You better say, you get away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Well, didn't you love me? I thought I did. But I love Jesus Christ more. And I don't want to be a fornicator anymore. My life changed. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Manifest. They're clearly seen. Adultery. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. Envyings. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. And such like. Anything where you're giving yourself over to the flesh, where you're doing a whole bunch of things that are, that are wicked and you just don't even care. If it feels good, do it. You know? Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That works in two ways. Kingdom of God is, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, talks about the kingdom of God uh, not being meat or drink but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You want righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? Then you better put down the flesh. You better flee fornication. You better beware lest any man spoil you, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's how you have spiritual fellowship with the Lord. But there's a second application here. Kingdom of God shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God can be a reference to the coming millennial kingdom. The Bible says if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If you don't suffer in this life, you're not going to have a millennial inheritance. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you mess around, not only are you going to mess up your life right now, if you don't flee fornication, if you don't flee the evil and stuff out there and say, oh, yeah, I don't want to get into this situation, I'm sorry, whatever. If you don't do that, you don't learn to mortify your members, you're going to mess up your life now, but also into the millennial kingdom. I mean, imagine being a Christian failure for all of eternity. Get up there, you fornicated, you, you did this, you did that, and whatever else, and there's going to be plenty of them, you know. Get up there, oh, oh, you know, where's your crowns at? Well, uh, I, I didn't get them. Why? Well, I went after the lust of the flesh. If it felt good, I did it. Um, you going to be ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years? Uh, no. Had a one-night stand. I messed around with my sin. I kept looking at pornography and looking at it and looking at it and looking at it until eventually, <laughs> sexual sin. Then God just took me and set me on a shelf and said, we'll be seeing you before real long. Paul delivered such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Mortify your members. Crucify the flesh. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You better take heed to my advice. I've seen it far too many times, and I've kept my mouth shut far too many times. I've seen Christians, they start to dabble. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to overcome it, brother. Uh -huh. Yeah, I did too. And you know what? I'm convinced, looking back now, that part of my problem was the fact that I was in a pagan temple, a uh, Baptist church. Um, those things are pagan. They're Greek Parthenons. They have an obelisk on top. I mean, it's just like, yeah, I wonder why there's so many problems there, so many sexual problems. And I was there early on and after I got saved and even early in my ministry, to the great shame for me to say that now, I was struggling with the thing of pornography. And I come up with all the excuses in the world. Well, you know, it's because I'm a single man, and, and you know, and 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 uh, you know, I just was having a bad day, and I you know just uh, uh huh. And I got to a point where I said, you know what, this needs to stop. And I'm going to take drastic action. And I could see the Lord was kind of giving me those little hints. 
You don't stop this thing soon. And if it goes full on fornication with some woman, you're done. You're never going to amount to anything for me. It was, well, if you do it, just, you know, just we'll get it under the blood and everything. You know, we'll just kind of cover it up. Brethren, there's a very, very, I don't want to call it special thing. There's a very serious thing that happens when you commit sexual sin. In the past, before you got saved, okay, that's under the blood. But I'll tell you what, nobody's going to look at you and say, yeah, I remember what you did back then and stuff like this. And, oh, you were so wicked and, and whatever else. I got, it was before I got saved. You know, are you wicked? You know, I mean, just that's fine. Everything's okay. But you mess around as a saved Christian and you commit some kind of sexual sin and now the lost people are blaspheming the book, the Bible. They're making fun of the Bible. They're making fun of you as a Christian. They're making fun of all Christians. Guess what? You're on the shelf. And if Paul said about the guy in his day and age, hey, I'm going to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. You think the devil's up there not asking the Lord, can I kill him now? He's the accuser of the brethren. He looks down and says, look at that. They just did this thing. They're making a mockery of your word. Can I kill them? And all the Christians, they aren't, they aren't rebuking them. They aren't saying, I'm sorry, I can't fellowship with you. You know? We need to take a harder stand against sin, brethren. And I, re I repent, okay? I'm sorry that a lot of times I have seen people and they're heading into trouble and I've seen it and I don't say anything because I don't want to offend and I don't want to lose friendships and I don't want to this and I don't want to that. That's wrong. I've been in sin for doing that. Let me tell you something, young person. If you are messing around with pornography, get it fixed up immediately. You better stop. I got to that point in my life where I said, you know what? I, I was literally to the point, I was so wicked and so bad with it that there were times it was like, if I go to hell because of this, if I have a chance right now, I can look at pornography and go to hell or not look at pornography and, and be right with God and whatever else. Using it as an analogy, I'm, I'm saved, I'm going to go to heaven, I understand. But there were times I said, I'm lusting so much right now, I'd rather go to hell and look at this pornography. That's how bad it was. Believe me, nobody out there is going to say to me, well, you don't know what kind of lust I'm going through, brother. Oh, yes, I do. I went through it. And I had to get to a point where I said, you know what, enough is enough. And I literally said, God, if I can't get this pornography addiction under control, I want you to kill me. I don't want to live anymore because I don't want to bring reproach upon your name. And it's a great shame to me to have to admit that going back into my saved life and even the early, early years of when I first got you know, into the ministry, I still struggled. And I wasn't saying every other night or something like that. It was a couple months and it would, I'd fall or whatever. Didn't matter. I was messing around with it. And the Lord gave me that victory because I said, God, I need help. And I, for a while, it was like, oh, oh, but Lord, if you could just bring me a wife, then I won't lust anymore after the pornography. Oh, yeah, that doesn't work either. Uh, no, you get your sin fixed up first before the Lord gives you what you want. If you're a pornography addict and then you get married, don't think, well, then I'm going to be able to have my sexual needs met and then I won't be a pornography addict anymore. It doesn't work that way. If you're a pornography addict before your marriage, you're going to be a pornography addict after your marriage. You have to get that thing fixed up between you and God. And you get it, but you better get it fixed up. Because if you don't, it's going to keep messing up your mind and messing up your mind and messing up your mind. And you're eventually going to do some kind of a sexual sin that you get caught in. And the lost world's going to say, look at that, Christian. And then the devil's got you. Another Christian down. And if you're out there and you're messing around with things like this, you're a married man and you're messing around with some girl at work and things like that, oh, you're just a young girl and we're just a friend. Yeah, uh -huh. you better stop. You better stop before it turns into fornication. If you're a woman, saved woman, saved sister, and you know some guy and whatever else, and some guy that you used to date and things, well, I'd still kind of occasionally see him. And so, you better stop. You better stop. Things have changed now since you've gotten saved. You better quit it. 
And as I've said, to my great shame, I have seen Christians get into this point here and I don't say, beware, you're about to be spoiled. I haven't taken a strong enough stand. I have been lukewarm many times because I don't want to offend people needlessly and I, I, I don't know where they're at and whatever. Speak up! Sexual sin is a serious, grievous thing that will destroy you as a Christian. I've seen it so many times. So many times. So I needed to get this thing out there. Um, and I pray that the Lord just tears you to pieces inside if you're dabbling. And it, you know, I've been saved. I've been in ministry. I love my wife and the whole deal and stuff like that. But you know what? Get out there in the stores and there goes some immodest little whore walking by and stuff like that. And the flesh still wants to go, oh, and look at it because of the years of pornography. You know, pornography trains you to undress women and things. You know, the fact. And I look and it's still, that struggle's still there. And it gets less and less and less over time, but it's still there. And I still have to remember, hey, you know what? I don't want to touch that woman. I don't want to even mess around. I don't want to flirt, be flirtatious with this woman at the store, this, this young girl over here, or that there, or whatever else. I'm not going to touch you. I'm going to be, a, I'll be as puritanical as I can be, brother, sister. I'm going to stay away and I'm going to say, hey, you know what? And they come over and they say, oh, you know what? Can I hug you? No, no, go, oh, get away from me. Starts flirting with me at the store and stuff like that. I've literally had women... I remember different times my wife, after she had Oliver, she couldn't, you know, go to the store with me. And so, I, oh, hey, I'll go do the grocery shopping. And then it, it was just like the devil just had these women just waiting for that opportunity. Just like spirits led them to, to, to be there and stuff. Immodest dressed, spike-heeled women just coming up and stuff like this and, and flirting and, you know, and, and low-cut tops and reaching in front of me and stuff like this. And you know what I did? Just turn and walk away. You think I'm going to say... Oh, excuse me, Carl. Can I help you get that and stuff like this and start striking up a conversation? No, no. I'm running the other way. Why? Because my Bible tells me to. I don't ever want to get to a place where I have to look and say, I, I don't know how that happened. I, I was just, it was innocent and I, I don't know what happened. And, and, and the ministry shuts down and people go, do you know what happened to Brian Denlinger? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they caught him in some woman's apartment someplace. Ha ha ha. I don't want that. And I don't want it for any of you either out there. But I see it. I see you dabbling. I see you messing around. Please pray for me. Yeah, I want to have more love in my preaching and I, want, I don't want to be so... You know, going after exposing this and exposing that. Not, yeah, sure, I've talked about that. I'm going to let those people alone. But you know what? There are some issues with sin that I see that I run across people in my, in my ministry circles and stuff like this. People email me. People send me letters and things. And you know what? Please pray that, I'm, that I have more of a backbone as a preacher. That I start saying, you need to stop that. I need prayer on that. I'm weak on that. There's times that I don't say things when I should. Uh, please pray for me. So, that's going to be it. I'm not going to smile and laugh in this, in this study and things because it grieves me. It vexes me. When I see my brothers and sisters in Christ and they're doing so good and I'm just like, praise Lord for brother so-and-so. Next thing I know, he did what? Oh, no. Children without a dad. A wife without a husband. All started so innocent, didn't it? Yep. We have to take stronger stands, brethren. I know a lot of you have written me and you've said, I'm struggling with pornography. Get it fixed. You say, well, I'm, I'm working on it. Don't work on it. Get it done. Okay? Take it serious. If you have to quit the internet, if you have to get away from whatever it is that's, that's causing you that temptation, then do it. 
stop. And if you know a Christian that's been a fornicator, the Bible says, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You get away from me. I'm not going to be able to fellowship with you. I'm sorry. If I see somebody and, and things in it and they've they've been through years and years and years and they've they've really shown that they've come back and they're trying to do something for the Lord, well, it's gonna be very, very careful. You know? I remember a brother, I'll just tell you a little story. There was a brother I knew, graduate of PBI, you know, and uh been a missionary and um fornicated. Had adultery, adulterous relationship. Wife and uh, I think three or four children. <sighs> Marriage just blew up. Had to come back to the States. And uh, he was, uh, you know, single for a while and things. Married a Jewish woman. And uh, she had alcohol problems and things like this. And, and it just, problem after problem after problem. And his children got into drugs. And it's just a whole thing. Just boom! Because of that sexual sin. And you know what? You say, well... Uh, so he was just ruined. Well, he was trying to serve the Lord, trying to do what he could and things like that. But I was around him and he'd flirt with women. Just kind of, you know, just joking and just, you know, the funny and stuff. Didn't learn his lesson. And I've seen that thing over and over and over again. They get messed up in that sexual sin and it's just like, away they go. And he didn't last very long at our uh, Bible Believers Fellowship. Didn't last very long. Had some issues. Don't fall for it, brethren. Take it serious. And I'll tell you right now, um, if I find out that you've fornicated, that you've brought shame and reproach upon God's book, I'm not going to have you as a friend. I'm going to become your enemy. See you in heaven. But on this earth, get away from me. Just as simple as that.